computer. Got it. Okay, so, oh my goodness, I am so excited today to introduce to you my guest for the Choose to Think podcast, Susan Mills. Now, you may remember that I had her husband, Cameron Mills, on episode 80. And if you haven't listened to that episode, you need to go back there and listen to it right now. And at the very end, you'll get a good sense of just how much Cameron loves this lady right here. Did you listen to that tribute, Susan? Did you hear what I he did. said? He's <laughs> such a sweetheart. But, you know, truth be told, I was sitting in the other room. So after it was recorded, I said, were you saying that because you knew I was listening? <laughs> but no, he's, he's just very, very sweet. He's the love of my life. So we're both very blessed. That's awesome. I love that interview. It was so much fun. He's such a storyteller and oh, he is. engaging. And it was just amazing to hear all the behind the scenes of what it's like to be a UK basketball player and his claim to fame and just so many yeah. interesting things that we chatted about. So thank you for coming on today. I really appreciate that. And I know my listeners are in for a big treat and anyone even watching on our little podcast group right now in that community, you're in for a treat because we're going to chat about autism and maybe you don't know much about autism. Maybe you have family members who are autistic and I have a little bit of experience with that. We do have autism. Some of my, uh, well, a nephew is autistic and so I have a teeny bit of knowledge about that, but as far as behind the scenes and what that really means, what it's like to experience that in a family, I have zero knowledge. And so Susan is going to unpack that for us. And why don't you just start, Susan, from the very beginning. You have my autism tribe, and that's kind of your, you're on a mission there and you're pursuing something there. So tell us about how you founded that particular organization and what that mission is. Okay, well, um, first off, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I thought you were a great interviewer with Cameron. So, um, and he had fun doing that. And um, it's always a pleasure just being able to, to share our story. Um, and encourage others that may be on that same path. And, um, and then also just to educate people that may not be on the path, but um, are one degree away from that path. So um, I founded my autism tribe. Um, it was about two years ago. Um, so the reason kind of in a nutshell that I founded it was my son um, was diagnosed with autism at the age of two and a half. And he was nonverbal pretty much until he was about the age of four and even then was very broken. Um, so I made a promise to him when he made his diagnosis, uh, when he had his diagnosis, that I would be his voice until his voice was strong enough. So my autism tribe is one voice made stronger. And um, I was trying to elevate my voice to be an advocate for my son and through all different types of platforms. And I always say that this isn't a story of autism, but this is a story of a family, a mom who will do absolutely anything that she can do um, to make sure that her son has the very best life and reaches his best potential. And so um, it's it's been a journey for sure. Um, I'll kind of go back a little bit um, at any time, feel free, because I get so amped up um, when I'm talking about my son and um, and just how awesome he is. And I know all of our children are are awesome, right? But I have the most awesome one. <laughs> oh, okay, well, we might have to disagree on that. I have some grandbabies now who are just amazing. Yeah. So he... Um, you know, just to share kind of, um, I'm an open book. So um, sometimes it, it might be too much information, but I always say, you know, sharing your story and sharing the, the real and the raw of it may help someone that is so, um, so much immensely in a dark place. Um, and I had wished, I, I had hoped that I would have had the same 
um, when I was in that place and, and I didn't. So, um, you know, I had a, a very healthy pregnancy. Um, Alex, uh, who's seven years old now, he was born without any complications. Um, 10 fingers, 10 toes, amazing, um, cute as a button and, uh, and, and still is, and sharp as a tack. Um, I say sometimes too smart for his own good, but um, he was developing normally. Um, I had the what to expect in the first year, you know, like yes. flipping through it. Yes. I was checking the boxes, patting myself on the back. I'm an awesome mom, you know, uh, tummy time was going great. Uh, and then, um, you know, there, there were certain delays in some areas, um, you know, in the babbling and people are always like, boys are so much later to talk than girls. And, but, you know, they're a little bit more physical first, you know, with walking or things like that. Um, so I really didn't pay too much attention to that. And, um, all of his wellness visits were going as scheduled. And, you know, again, we were checking the boxes. And then around, I would say 18, 19, 20 months, I started to see regression in some areas. And, um, and it wasn't anything that was overnight. Um, you know, the, um, a lot of people will bring into the question, you know, vaccine injuries and things like that. Um, I don't believe that that he is or he was, um, but there was just regression as far as like taking things out of his diet that he, you know, he went from eating just about anything to having a very, very restricted diet to maybe only two or three foods. And one of those was Pediasure, which has a ton of sugar, but it has a ton of calories and it was just to keep the calories in his body so he wouldn't lose weight. Um, he started losing eye contact. He would sit on the floor and could for hours and just rearrange his toys and line them up by size. And, um, and it was hard to pull him out of that. It's like he was turning into his own world. And it was so, so hard to watch this happening and not knowing what was going on. And I remember at his two year um, wellness visit with his pediatrician, she made the comment, well, he is quiet. Um, so maybe we can start him in the early steps of uh, speech therapy. And I said, okay, well, let, let's do it. Um, you know, they give you the piece of paper. Is your child pointing to things? Is your child bringing you into their world? And he wasn't. There was about half of the boxes that he was no longer doing or hadn't started doing. And so um, I, I remember very clearly in that meeting with her, um, asking her about autism because I had already started Googling, you know, we go down these Google rabbit holes yes. um, for good or for bad. And because we start just, you know, if we see something off, it's like, what is this? Something in my gut was telling me that something was off. And so she said, you know, he's two and we really don't like to give any kind of diagnosis that young. And, um, and so, you know, just keep your eye on it. Let's get him started with the speech therapy, maybe occupational therapy, and we'll see how that goes. So we started, it was an hour of speech therapy a week. It was an hour of occupational therapy a week. And they would come to the home. And to be quite honest, I was doing the same things with him that they were. We just still weren't making any kind of traction with it. It was really disheartening. Um, and so at, at about, I don't know, it was about a few months into that, I told my husband at the time, um, not Cameron, but my I'm divorced. Um, I told him, I said, listen, I said, I really want to get him evaluated um, for autism. And he was said, no, 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 he's not, he's not on the autism spectrum. There's nothing wrong with him. He's just developing a little bit later than, than, you know, his peers. And 
Um, and it was just, it, I, I, I said, no, we, we, this is something we have to do. So I started calling around and we were living in Illinois at the time. So I started calling around and, and everyone had really long waiting lists for evaluations. And I remember, um, just calling the, the insurance company and just saying, Hey, where can we get in? And it got to the point where I would spend two or three hours a day on the phone with someone someone trying to just to get an eval. And I finally got to such a point of desperation that I was on the phone with this one lady. One day I had taken a break. I was taking breaks from, from work. Yeah. I would go on my lunch break. I would go to my car. I would go to a bathroom break and I would be on the phone just calling. And I got on the phone with this lady and I was in tears. I said, um, there's something wrong with my son. Um, and I, I need someone to help him. And she said, um, let me call around and let me see what I can do. Um, is this the best number to call you? I said, I know you're going to call me back. That's what everyone's been telling me. Um, but no one calls me back. And, um, and that's when I broke into tears. And she said, ma'am, she said, I promise you, I will call you back. And by the end of that day, she had. Wow. She called me back and she said, I have... Uh, an opening in Chicago um, this coming Thursday or something. Can you be there? And I said, yes, yes, I will absolutely be there. Just tell me where, just tell me when I will go. And so we packed our bags. I took the day off. We went to Chicago. We sat in a room for about four or five hours with, dip, with a rotating door of doctors and physicians and therapists. And by the end of that session, the pediatrician um, that was there said, your son has autism. And even though in my heart of hearts that I knew that that's what it was, it still felt like getting hit by a Mack truck. It just was overwhelming. And, um, and that, so, but my first question is, was, um, well, where on the spectrum is he? Is right. he severe? Is he, you know, is he high functioning? And they're like, he's two and a half. So he's so young. Um, but with intensive therapy, um, we have seen great, great progress, um, you know, and, um, but we don't know, um, you know, what his potential is at this point in time. I do have a question. What is the spectrum? Is that just a kind of a measurement that does it start one side autism and then the other side is still autism and it's just yeah. variations in that? Yeah, okay. that's a great question. And a lot of people will say, you know, is he severe? Is he high functioning? You know, and they think the spectrum is that. Um, and, and to some degree it is, there are higher levels of function, you know, on the spectrum. It used to be that there was uh, what people call Asperger's. Mm -hmm. um, there was autism or pervasive developmental, you know, not otherwise specified where everyone was trying to figure out like, is this autism? There's the DSM that has like the diagnostic criteria for autism and really what they did was it's it's autism spectrum disorder and it is a spectrum because no matter where you are on the spectrum there are my you know Alex still has some I call them eating defenses like he still has like sensory processing disorder so some things like as far as auditory you know loud sounds and strong smells and stuff that he doesn't really like um, but someone that isn't quote unquote higher functioning may not have any of that. So it's just this whole colorful spectrum where it doesn't matter where you are, every single person, you know, like if someone says I have breast cancer, there is a very diagnostic criteria on this is what that is. And this is how we treat it with autism. It is not. It is, it is very much a, not a one size fits all. It is here is this person and here is this person and here is this person. And they all have very different potentials. They all have very different sensitivities, um, you know, and, uh, and, and it's just, it is the most uh, fascinating, maddening, uh, frustrating, beautiful thing 
um, that I've ever experienced. Um, so it's, um, you know, my, my son has some severe, um, weaknesses and he also has incredible absolute strengths and, um, and that's ever evolving. So it's, um, it's crazy. He's been through a ton of therapy and, um, in that room, the doctor said, you know, one thing that we recommend is ABA therapy, and that stands for Applied Behavioral Analysis. It's behavior therapy, and it's essentially rewiring the brain, breaking down simple concepts into bite-sized pieces that make it easier to for our brains to digest. And so it's not something as like, for someone that you would say, okay, this is how you brush your teeth. You get your toothbrush, you put the toothpaste on it, and then you brush. Well, for Alex, something like that would be pick up the toothbrush. Have you ever done that exercise where you try to walk someone else through on how to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Yes. And it's like that it it doesn't happen. It's just like get the bread. Okay, get the bread. Put it to get. It just doesn't. That's how his brain works. Sometimes he he likes the intricacy of things. He has to have that. Um, so it is pick up the toothbrush, hold it in your hand, pick up the toothpaste, hold it, open up the cap. It is breaking all of that down through repetition, time and time and time again. Um, there are other things where he picks up the first time. That's it. So none of this makes sense. Um, but so I said, um, so ABA therapy, that's what you recommend. And he said, yes. He said, so go back to Peoria, Illinois. That's where we were living mm -hmm. and look for ABA therapists. So we went back. I started on the phone again, trying to call ABA therapists. Everyone said we have um, extensive um you know, waiting lists. We don't know. It could be two years before we start your son oh and therapy. And, um, and that's incredibly scary. So again, um, I started, you know, basically just being the squeaky wheel mm -hmm. and calling and calling and calling and calling. And once again, um, I was, um, I got hold of this company and, um, and I said, listen, I know that he's requiring like 40 hours of ABA therapy, but if we could even start off with 10 or 15. And so they said, um, so there was a, a small waiting list. They ended up putting us on the waiting list. They ended up getting about 15 hours of therapy on it. So he started therapy. The insurance then told me, we are not paying for it. Oh, yes. um, so it is considered educational and not medical. And so, um, you know, so eventually at one point in time, the level of therapy that he was having, we were paying about $3,000 a week out of pocket. And, um, and that's just not sustainable. So, um, so I started researching for states that had insurance mandates and Kentucky was one of those states at the time. And, um, and so uh, I got a call out of the blue, which wasn't out of the blue. It was very much a God thing um, from an employer that I had worked with about 10 years prior to that, or 15 years prior to that, asking if I'd ever thought about moving back to Kentucky. Um, that they had a position available and they thought that I'd be perfect for it. And I said, well, let's talk. So um, long story short, we ended up moving back to Kentucky. Um, we ended up getting him into a really, really strong ABA therapy program. We went from paying $3,000 a week down to $20 a day for his wow. therapy. And he started making such tremendous progress that three years ago or two, two years ago, he quote unquote graduated from his ABA therapy program. So he is, is, um, is doing so well this last year during the pandemic was, um, kind of a wrench in everything. Um, but he's, uh, the doors are open to the school and we're back in and, um, and he's once again, thriving again. So that's kind of it in a huge, huge nutshell. Wow. Wow. 
I want to unpack. You said that this experience is fascinating, maddening, and beautiful. So could mm -hmm. you tell us how it's fascinating and how it's beautiful? I think I have an idea of how it's maddening and just the, yeah. the frustration that I think of how when I even parented my children, I would get so frustrated with the simplest things sometimes, or maybe I would yeah. be impatient. So I don't know if that's a little bit of what you mean. And it's, it's maddening. And some of your experience though was maddening and let me get him the care that he needs. I'm sure that's a part of what you were talking about too. And the frustration of being on the phone and trying to get all of this orchestrated, but, and maybe on a different level, it was maddening on the day to day of it all with him. I don't know, maybe you're extremely patient and that wasn't maddening, but at any rate, if you could unpack those three, why is it fascinating? Why maddening and why beautiful? That would be interesting yeah. to hear. Yeah, it's, um, it's fascinating because our brains are fascinating. Um, we experience so much in our lives and there are things tucked away in boxes in our brain that we may not have even truly accessed yet and really settled into. And all of these experiences in our life are what create us and make us who we are. Um, the, the trauma that we've had in life, the beautiful moments that we've had in life, um, the people that have come in and out of our lives, all of the experiences, that in and of itself is fascinating. And then to see how autism is in the brain, and there's still so, so much that we have to learn about it. Um, just to think back and hear these stories of um, adults and what they went through and the lack of therapy that they had, um, you know, growing up and um, is just, um, it's mind boggling. And the type of therapy that Alex had, ABA therapy, where it's literally rewiring the brain and desensitizing some of those things, like a lot of the sensory exercises that he, that he's, he's done. He, um, the way our brains interpret sounds. So it's like um, he, his, his, um, his sense of hearing is so heightened that he can hear things that I, I wouldn't even hear. And it's amplified in a way. So if we go into a restaurant, um, you know, the sounds, the, the clinking of the fork on the plate, the way his brain processes that is very different from how ours processes it. It's like there are certain synapses that don't fire. Um, and But with training, literally like sensitivity training, we can start training our brains to desensitize to some of those things. Um, and then as far as the part of maddening, you have you have just the overall maddening process of, you know, you have extensive waiting lists for people to not only be evaluated for autism, but then after you have the evaluation, you, it's like you, you receive this certificate. I graduated. Now I get to, you know, uh, go on to bigger and better things. And then you're told we have extensive waiting lists for therapy. And so it's like, as soon as you reach one milestone, you have another milestone, another hurdle that you have to go through. And the same with, you know, behaviors. There, there may be, you know, as soon as you feel like, okay, I've got this thing figured out. You know, I know my son inside and out. There's a little thing that's thrown in there, you know, that it's like, oh, I thought, I remember there was one time where for whatever reason, we were in a restaurant and he ate cauliflower like steamed cauliflower. And I remember just looking like, what just happened? Are you seeing this? Is this happening? <laughs> so what did I do? I went to the store and I just got a ton <laughs> of cauliflower. The kid has never, ever once eaten it again, has had no interest in it whatsoever. But in that moment, it was the best thing ever. I have no idea. So it's maddening. Like you, you're trying to figure out like, this, this person who was created in your womb 
And you think that you know, and I know that I know him more than anybody else on this planet. Uh Um, And yet you still try to wrap your head around it. And then, you know, um, I think, I can't remember the third. um, Well, let's just pause there because what about patience though? How did you deal with patience on a day-to-day basis? Let's say, or any frustration, did that just well up in you? How did it grow you as a mom? How did you deal with those frustrations that I'm sure were there? They're there with my children. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they were even augmented, say with Alex or under this Mm -hmm. scenario, I'm not sure. But how did you deal with that? Like if he's wanting to do something repetitively, for example, and you need to get out the door and you're, how did you slow down enough to be calm and patient and tender and loving or whatever it was that he needed that he would respond to? How did you train yourself to engage in that way instead of just flying off the handle or going crazy or, you know, putting fuel to the flame there. Does this make sense as a question even? Yep, absolutely. Um, You know, I have to say that um, from the moment he popped out, I I became a different person. Um, Mm. There's a whole other level of patience that I never even knew existed within myself. Um, And then when you have on top of that, all of the, um, there were so many times and it it was a dark, dark time when Alex received his diagnosis. And I always tell people, I said, you know, I spent a a very, very good six months researching for ways to blame myself on why this happened. Was it something that I did? Was it something I ate? Was it something that I did when I was 10 years old? Was it, you know, what, what caused this? It must've been done something that I did. And, um, and then one, you know, one person that I, it was at work, um, said, you know, you can, you can continue to beat yourself up up with this. You can research for ways. And she said, but at the end of the day, he is still your beautiful child. And Mm -hmm. that doesn't change anything. It does not change his diagnosis. It does not. And so, um, and I hadn't really thought about it up until that point in time, but I started becoming more patient um, with myself and that, um, that patience rolled over. I've always been patient with Alex. Um, and I, I don't know why, even when he was having a meltdown or anything like that, I can't say that there's never been stress there. Mm-hmm. Um, because there's definitely been stressful times and, um, you know, uh, and I won't go into full details, but my marriage at that time too was, um, was not good. And um, there was a lot of abuse there. And so when I moved back to Kentucky, I had to move back to Kentucky to be closer to family for Alex and I to be safe. And, um, and so there was a lot of personal turmoil that was going on at the same time when Alex had received his diagnosis. So I had no choice other than to be patient and to survive. Mm -hmm. Um, there was no other choice. It's either it's me and you kid, um, or we're just not going to make it. And so I think we we're just, we sometimes don't realize and until we are in that survival state of mode, like the, um, you know, do we really know what our strength is? And there were times where I was just full on my knees and just completely submitting myself to God and saying, if you are there, if you are listening, please just show yourself, smack me in the face with it. I want to see the door open, sun shining, angels singing, I need to know you're there and, and he is powerful and he moved in ways that I never expected. And, um, 
and still continues to do so today. Sometimes I still ask me to smack me in the head with what he's blessing me with, but, um, but that's just a part of my flesh, I guess. Um, it's just, um, yeah, it's all of that that taught me to have the utmost patience in not only myself, but in God, um, because it is his timing and he knows what's best. Yeah, it's interesting to me that though you may have blamed yourself, you never blamed God. Is that fair to say? That's you never, fair. You yeah. never shook a fist at him or said, how could you? Why is this going on in my family? Why is this happening to me? You were never kind of pointed to yourself in that way? I did have some pity parties where, you know, I would just say, why is this happening to me? Why is this happening to my son? Why, why us, you know, but, um, but I never was angry with God. Um, I questioned, I had a lot of questions. I wanted answers. I wanted him to send me a document as to why this was happening. And like 10 bullet know, points. Please, off. Lord. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Give me the 10 bullet points and then, okay, maybe I'll, I'll understand. Need a spreadsheet, God. I need a spreadsheet. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Thank you for sharing that. That was very vulnerable. What you shared even to say we've all been there, whether we've had a child or gone through this experience, we've, I think it's safe to say that we've all been to the point where we've called out, where are you God? Mm -hmm. And I know I have, and it's so sweet and tender that he met you there in your low moments, he was there. He doesn't change, he doesn't go anywhere. And he met you there and continues to do that. The last question that I ask, based on what you said, you said, this has been fascinating, maddening and beautiful. And that might be a really nice way to even end out our chat. How has this been beautiful? Well, um, I can only specifically say this for my son. Um, I don't want to say autism is beautiful because there's a lot of like just pain. Um, and the, my, my podcast, um, I I've heard so many just utter painful stories, um, of parents that are in the trenches every day. So I never want to make that mistake of saying that autism is a hundred percent beautiful because there's not, um, you know, in, in all ways. However, um, there are times where I see the beauty of my son's thinking process and just how gifted he is in thinking in ways that I wouldn't, I wouldn't think to think like it. And he just, and I don't know if this has become, uh, because I always like, even before, when we go to bed at night, I have what we call positive speak. And that is where we talk about what were your two favorite things that happened today? Um, and at one point in time, it was, what was your favorite? Um, and then now it's two favorites. And so, and then how he was awesome that day, something that he overcame or something that he was just awesome. It could have been that we had a lazy day and we didn't do anything, but because he said, please and thank you, it could be just very, very simple, but that is positive speak. I want those positive words to be the last thing that he hears before he goes to sleep. I think that's very important for him. I think it's very important for us to do that to ourselves with ourselves yes. before we, you know, when we lay down, when we say our prayers, it was, you know what, you were good enough today. And this is why. Um, so with the way his brain, you know, works in a, in a beautiful way, I don't know if people have read the book or seen the movie, Beautiful Mind, but the way he can dissect things um, is, is beautiful. The way he can see beauty in things that I wouldn't necessarily see, he can walk into a room and he can see details that I think a lot of us would would pass over, you know, he can hear things in a way that some of us may not hear. And there's such beauty in that. I think that he is, um, you know, people say, well, I, I don't think people with autism are in tune, you know, and I think that that is the exact opposite. 
I think they are so in tuned and feel so deeply. Mm -hmm. I have seen him stand back in, in the look on his face where his heart is hurting for something. Mm -hmm. You know, I have seen him be encouraging, you know, to a little um, child on the playground. Great job. Glad you did that. You know, just he, um, he's like the biggest cheerleader for people. He told me the other day, he said, I'm so proud of you. Oh, and, um, you know, he just, he's, he just has the biggest heart and the most beautiful mind. And I just can't wait to see like what awesome things he's going to do, um, in his, in his bright future. Thank you for sharing that. That is so sweet. And Susan, if there's any message or something you might say to encourage another mom in with any area, any perhaps any child issue, whatever it might be, what would you say to them, to that, to that mom or that dad who is thinking, wow, this is just a little bit too much for me or just any encouragement or final words there for those people? Yeah, I would just say if, if you are on the path of, of autism and trying to figure everything out, um, never hesitate to voice a weakness that you're having, um, ask for help. And, um, and I, I've even told like some of the, my listeners on the podcast, it is okay if you, if, if you go like for a week and something as simple and ridiculous as, you know what, this week we're going to use paper plates and plastic forks mm -hmm. because I just can't do the dishes this week. Like just start simplifying your life and really focusing on the things that really matter. Do we have to eat on fine China? No, the food's going to taste the same and you don't have to do dishes afterwards. So you have to give yourself grace in so much of this. And that's just for any parent, that's for any person. There are gonna be ebbs and flows in life. And, um, and, I, and I'm saying all of this as I'm like, okay, I need to work on these things still <laughs> to myself. Sure. It sounds great, but to implement those on a daily basis, we have to make very conscious decisions on when our feet hit the floor in the morning, when our eyes open in the morning, you say, okay, how can I make this the best day possible? And there are gonna be off days and that is okay. You just have to pick yourself up and know that you can keep going and just find your support system. Um, that in and of itself is probably the very, very best thing that you can do is just having someone that will do nothing but just even listen um, mm -hmm. and then just shake their head. Been there, done that or just come here, let me give you a hug and let that be, and let that be good. Very good. How can people reach you, Susan? Well, um, I have a website. It's myautismtribe.org or you can type in .com too. It'll both go to the same place. Um, my contact information is on there. Um, there's a form you can fill out if you have a question. We're on Facebook and uh, Instagram and Twitter and YouTube, um, all under my autism tribe. Um, Susan Mills on like personally, like if you have a personal question that you just want to reach out and if you just want to say, hey, um, I enjoyed listening to the podcast or whatever. Um, I always love it. I had a lady that just gave me a call from right outside Chicago the other day. I picked up the phone. She said, hey. And I said, hi, she said, this is Shonda. Uh, <laughs> my daughter's autistic and my husband's driving me crazy. And I said, so we ended up talking for like 10, 15 minutes. She just wow. wanted to give me a call. So I love meeting people. I love sharing stories um, and, um, and just helping lifting each other up. Well, that is so apparent. And now you can officially tell Cameron that I have a new favorite podcast guest, and that would be you. And your words are powerful. 
Your words are true. Your words have brought life to me and I'm sure to other folks watching and those who will be listening when this actual podcast airs. Your message is powerful and it's so, I don't know, I don't even know if I have the words, but it's been very pleasant and real and your transparency, I appreciate so much because somehow I think, okay, Susan is doing this in a way that is just spectacular, but I also know that you rely on God and that he is your strength and he is your support and it's uh, what you've painted, this picture you've painted may not be the story for everyone going through this, but you've offered a little glimpse us together to just get a little bit of a glimpse into what is possible and how to navigate this. You've been such a bulldog in researching and, you know, holding on and not letting go and just that tenacious spirit that you have. Not everyone has that, but maybe you're sharing this could allow that to rise up in them today and allow them to think, you know, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep pushing. I'm going to be my child's advocate in this situation. I'm going to fight. His fight is my fight Mm -hmm. and my voice will be his voice. I think that's the way you say it. My fight is your fight. My voice is your voice. So what a beautiful way to, um, to kind of bookmark all of this, the great love of a mom for her child and the amazing love of the God we serve for us, his kids, his children. So thank you so much for for showing up and sharing and just your your beautiful spirit here and testimony. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. Yeah, it's so I look much forward fun. to like maybe I don't know. Cameron and I can come in and do a comedy routine on your podcast. Sometime. Yes, we need that. We need we need to talk marriage because yes. I, although I think you all may still kind of be in the honeymoon stage, I'm not sure. But he's so we funny. Can that fifty years from now. Too. <laughs> I hope so. That would be awesome. But but I'm gonna put that down. We need to do that maybe around Valentine's Day. We'll air sure. something. We'll just think of something really creative to title it, and and yeah. um, we'll just watch you. I'll just sit back and just let you all just do it. So it sounds so fun. But we thank you fun. again. Thank you so much. All right. I'm yeah, gonna. You're welcome. Yeah. Okay. Let me um, exit out here for the live stream.